focus on everything you wanted to know about pituitary hormone replacement. Um, pituitary hormone replacement, what's the big deal? Pituitary disorders are common, but experts in treating them properly are not. Small changes in replacement may be a big improvement in symptoms. Many endocrinologists do not understand how to properly replace patients with hypopituitarism and do not understand or believe in monitoring hormone levels. We simply see the need to do more. What are the causes of hypopituitarism? Anywhere along the hypothalamic uh, stalk pituitary axis. Um, we published a paper in uh, 2008 on microadenomas. We'll talk about that in a second. So uh, pituitary tumors, both microadenomas and macroadenomas, pituitary surgery, pituitary radiation, Sheehan syndrome, pituitary apoplexy, uh, hypophosphatitis, and pituitary inflammation, emphysema, malnutrition, and critical illness and head trauma are all causes. Stock uh, causes include cranial pharyngiomas, brain tumors, CNS malignancies, surgery, radiation, head trauma, and accidents, infiltrative diseases like histiosarcosis X, hemochromatosis, and sarcoid, infections, and drugs such as steroids, dopamine analogs, and somatostatin analogs. Um, where can your deficiencies occur? Anywhere along the HP, along the axis, you can have problems with your adrenals, the adrenal start cortical trope cells, the axis is CRH, ACTH, and cortisol, the thyrotrope cells, TRH, TSH, and T4 and T3, um, the gonadal axis with the gonadotropes being affected, GNRH, LH, nephosage, and testosterone and estradiol, and growth hormone, the somatotropes, you have growth hormone releasing hormone, growth hormone, IGF-1, and the pituitary hormone, posterior pituitary hormones, ADH and oxytocin. The orders of deficiencies include growth hormone uh, is usually first, and anatropins like FSH and LH are second, TSH is third, ACTH is fourth, prolactin is fifth. And the posterior pituitary hormones I used to put as uncommon and rare, um, but with our new interest in oxytocin, which I'm going to talk about, maybe they're not so, uh, oxytocin deficiency may not be so rare. Um, microadenomas and hyperpituitism, we published a paper again with uh, Dr. Ewan from Oregon State, uh, Oregon Health Sciences, um, that patients with low IGF-1 and microadenomas are likely to be both hormone deficient and could have central hypothyroidism and hypogonadism. And um, I look at this a little differently than most of my endocrinology colleagues. Most endocrinologists test for hyperpituitism only if the patient has had prior surgery or radiation to the pituitary. My approach is to measure the pituitary hormones first and if it points to hypopituitarism, then get an MRI. So we'll talk about the different axes and how to treat them. Uh, first axis is glucocorticoid insufficiency, and you need to have a significant impairment in your pituitary function. Um, this is the hormone that's usually the most um, uh, preserved. Classically, the pituitary only affects cortisol, not mineral corticoids, which are the salt radiating hormones from the adrenals. Um, this can be life threatening, but most patients do surprisingly well. Symptoms of uh, corticoid insufficiency or fatigue, lethargy, nauseousness, vomiting, joint pains, abdominal pain, weight loss, hypoglycemia, which is relatively rare in adult, adults, and low sodium. Um, the diagnosis what I recommend would be to start by checking the ADM or earlier fast cortisol level. And this can usually make or exclude the diagnosis. If somebody has a cortisol less than five, likely they have adrenal insufficiency greater than 12, it's likely they don't. Um, this should only be done in patients with signs and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency or history such as radiation or pituitary surgery. Um, like most tests, it shouldn't just be done randomly. Um, it can be used in patients in those patients with a moderate index of suspicion, and then you can measure an ACTH level to distinguish between primary and secondary insufficiency. Um, but you have many patients that have a, um, a value between 5 and 12, it's also the patients that you may have to do a, a cosentropin test on. Um, the standard one-hour cosentropin test should only be done on those with uh, signs and symptoms or likely causes of adrenal insufficiency, because it can have uh, several po false positive tests. And this test usually 250 micrograms of IV bolus of cosentropin, which is synthetic ACTH is given. It so usually can be given in the morning or the afternoon. You measure cortisol at 0, 30, and 60 minutes. A cortisol greater than 18 in any time rules out primary adrenal insufficiency and 90% of secondary adrenal insufficiency. If the peak is less than 10, glucocorticoid replacement is usually required. 
if the peak is between 10 and 18. Total cord heart replacement is recommended during stresses and maybe during every day, depending on the condition. Uh, some um, doctors looked at the incremental increase in cortisol. I don't recommend that. And the important thing with this test is you need to have central hypocortisol them for about a month, although some articles say 12 days, prior to the test to develop adrenal atrophy and fail the test. So the uh, HTH stands for adrenal corticotrophic hormone. So if your pituitary is not working, the HTH is low and your adrenal atrophy. That's how this test works, but it has to be done over a period of time. There is also a one microgram cosentropin test with the idea that it's 250 microgram dose is super physiological and will miss subtle quarter insufficiency. Certainly mild ACTH deficiency exists like mild hypothyroidisms and the uh, consequence of missing the test uh, may be uh, severe. So you want to know why do the test? I want to ask why do the test? You sort of figure out which test to do. And in general, I like to know uh, that people have borderline HD access function, but put as few people as possible on replacing steroids. This test needs better cutoffs. I think 16 would be a reasonable dose for the one microgram and 18 for the, um, the 250 microgram test. Um, but the cutoffs really haven't been established. Um, salivary cortisols are widely advocated by alternative providers. There's these companies that market directly to patients called Diagnostic, ZRT, and several others. Um, the uh, salivary cortisol needs to lack both precision and accuracy. You can measure it a couple different times and you get different results. It does measure free cortisol, so it might be an advantage. Uh, as Dr. Heinmarsh says, it can give you a little bit of a day curve. You can compare it to normals, but you don't really know exactly what the normal should be either. So one of the problems I have with these is except for a low morning cortisol, I'm not sure what to do if you have a high value at noon or low value at five compared to the normals they give you, which I'm not sure how normal they are. I'm not sure really what to do. So I try to reserve your salivary cortisol testing for a reliable lab like Quest or LabCorp. Um, but I, there hasn't been any showing that um, these are better than serum values. The serum values, you can measure the cortisol binding globulin, and you can um, calculate out um, the free cortisol from that. If you're concerned about being on uh, birth control pills or things like that, you measure the change of the binding globulin. Um, so at least right now, I don't see that much of a need for salivary cortisols for picking up adrenal insufficiency. Um, I want to remind uh, people that ACTH is the last hormone to be affected in pituitary insufficiency. Growth hormone TSH and gonadotrophs are usually lost first. Symptoms with glucocorticoid insufficiency are unique. Weight loss, nausea, abdominal pain, or a common one, diarrhea. Primary adrenal insufficiency is relatively rare and also has a unique uh, symptom and lab complex. Once started, glucocorticoids may be hard to stop and are often very detrimental. So it might be a false positive test if you fail your post-entropy test, for example, unless it's in the right context. So think twice before putting somebody or starting glucocorticoids. A lot of patients that I see will put on it inappropriately and have trouble getting off of it. Glucocorticoids do stimulate your mood, so the fact that somebody feels better when they take glucocorticoids doesn't necessarily mean they have adrenal insufficiency. Um, the daily production cortisol rate was uh, done when I was at the NIH in the uh, 90s. Um, it's about uh, 10 milligrams per day. Most of, um, but not all, cortisol is absorbed, so it's usually to hit that uh, 10 milligrams per day is what the body makes. You need to take about 12 to 15 milligrams per day. Most doctors give people too much uh, glucocorticoids, it's super physiological. It leads to osteoporosis, glucose intolerance, and increases infections. Um, the true physiological replacement is likely to be fairly benign, but is often hard to do. And a lot of my patients, we struggle with giving the right dose idea. Yeah. Um, most patients are overtreated. Um, the earliest manifestation of excess treatment is easy bruising, weight gain, and central obesity can occur. The earliest manifestation of inadequate treatment is joint pain, but also abdominal pain. Um, Nauseousness is quite common. Uh, diarrhea is quite common. Um, it's reasonable to mimic the circadian rhythm with most or all the cortisol given first thing in the morning. Um, in general, you want to uh, avoid high doses at night as it could lead to sleep disturbances. But I did a study when I was in the PMH published in 2000 that shows that some patients need a little bit of cortisol to go to deep sleep at night. Um, so I think that could be helpful to give a small dose of cortisol before going to bed. 
Um, there really isn't any studies comparing the different um, uh, types of treatments, prednisone versus dexamethasone versus cortisol. So my approach is to use hydrocortisone. I give most of it in the morning, somewhere between 10 to 20 milligrams for women, slightly higher dose for men. Um, decrease slowly until some symptoms develop and can go back a, a notch. Uh, small changes make a big difference. You increase the dose with illness. Short term, it's better to err on giving more. Long term, it's better to err on giving less. How do you monitor glucocorticoid replacement with signs and symptoms? You can do a 24 hour urine for 17 hydroxy steroids. The urine free cortisol tends to be high during replacement. In replacement, most of the urine free cortisol excretion occurs right after taking the cortisol. So as the high doses are not down, the cortisol binding globin exceeds the reabsorption by the kidney. The 17 hydroxy steroids corrected with gamma creatinine uh, reflects cortisol metabolism and is more integrated throughout the day. So that's all a feasible way to, um, to monitor. Um, recover, uh, coverage for illness or um, surgery. Um, it's usually good to give stuff, and it's what we probably overtreat. Try to keep the duration short, though. Um, modern illness in the hospital, you can give 50 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone twice a day. Severe illness, you can give 100 milligrams uh, IV every eight hours. Minor procedures without anesthesia usually don't need any extra coverage. Moderately stressful procedures such as endoscopy or arteriography, single dose of 100 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone before the procedure. Major surgery, 100 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone before the anesthesia, and every eight hours afterwards for a day or so. Uh, for minor illnesses, the exercise, you can add 1.25 milligrams to 2.5 milligrams before the exercise. Flus and colds, you can add 10, 5 to 10 milligrams of fever. Pneumonia, sinus infection, urinary tract infections, double the dose, but do it for as short as possible and try to use good clinical judgments. There's a concept um, widely proposed by alternative anti aging doctors called adrenal fatigue. There's lots of internet discussion on it. It's often based on the salivary cortisol assays that are often marketed directly to patients that lack both precision and accuracy. The theory is that quote unquote stress leads the adrenals to work harder and make more cortisol. Then it burns out or peters out and makes less cortisol. According to Dr. Tori Hudson, a naturopathic physician, it's like a hormone factory and it wanes in its production. One of the ways it wanes is just by stress. Alternative doctors uh, may give herbs and supplements to stimulate the adrenal gland. Some of these may be fairly effective. Um, they can also give a medicine called isocort. Isocort used to be made up of ground up sheep adrenals, so it was pretty nasty. Now it's made by supplements, so it's not so bad. Or they can give hydrocortisone, which is a quite a dangerous uh, drug to give if you don't need it. One alternative said for the treatment is to eat lean, green, clean. I think that's a reasonable choice for everybody. Um, so I have to be against that for somebody who's um, advocating treatment for adrenal fatigue. I just think people should watch out and not take it for signs of hydrocortisone based on this idea. Um, in terms of the reality, however, the adrenals are upregulated during stress and make more cortisol, not less cortisol. A study from 2006 looked at uh, 74 clinically uh, diagnosed burnt out individuals mostly on sick leave and compared them with 35 healthy controls. They found similar salivary cortisols after waking at different times of the day and after overnight dexamethasone suppression in the two groups. So overall, patients should not be put on cortisol unless they are shown to be adrenally insufficient. Um, next topic, we're going to yes, that's happened. Um, I haven't seen any. It's a good question. Um, essential hyperthyroidism. Essential hyperthyroidism can occur uh, with any type of pituitary damage, even small tumors. Um, I think mild cases may be more clinically manifested than mild than subclinical hyper primary hyperthyroidism because you're actually having low thyroid hormones in central hyperthyroidism. You have a low free T4 in the face of a lowish TSH. You have similar signs and symptoms as in primary hypothyroidism. And in mild cases, the free T4 is between 0 0.3, I'm sorry, 0 0.7 and 1.0. And usually measuring T3 is not that helpful for central hypothyroidism. How do you diagnose uh, central hypothyroidism? There used to be a test called a TRH test, pretty much hard to impossible to get in the United States. Um, it can show a blunted TSH response to TRH. You can do a nocturnal TSH test. We did this a lot when I was at the NIH in the 90s. 
Uh, the TSH should rise at least 1.5 fold between 5 p.m. and midnight, and normal, but not in patients with central disease. But it's not that hard to get people to get it in midnight blood to cortisol. So it's usually based on the free T4 and the TSH, with the free T4 being low and the TSH being sort of lowish or inappropriately low. Okay, so in terms of treatment, um, the thyroid gland, and this is somewhat sort of consistent with treatments I do for primary hypothyroidism, the thyroid gland makes both T4 and T3. T3 is the active hormone, it has a short half life. T4 has a long half life. Uh, levothyroxine is often given, LT4. Um, but just that in, summer, in primary hypothyroid patients, many of them do better on T4 T combination, which I'll go over in the next couple slides. Some patients with central hypothyroidism may also do better on T4 T3 combinations. Both hormone deficiency can lead to impaired T4 to T3 conversion, so T3 may be especially beneficial in central hypothyroidism. I usually monitor by having the free T4 in the upper range of normal, usually about 1.5 to 1.7. The TSH is usually suppressed at the beginning and it's not worth measuring after starting treatment. Patients with both primary hypothyroidism, and question from over there before, and central components uh, could, should be monitored with a free T4 and not TSH measurement. Um, there's many options for thyroid hormone replacement, just like there's many drugs for blood pressure. You can give T4 alone. They include generic levothyroxine, Synthroid, Naboxyl, a great drug called Tyrosin, which has very little fillers, or Unithroid. Theory, you can give T3 alone, you can do T4, T3 combinations. You can use desiccated thyroid, armor thyroid, nature thyroid, WP thyroid is one of the ones I use frequently, or Urfa is from England, from Canada. These are you know, from pig thyroids and are um, involved with extraction from the, of the, uh, the active hormones from the big thyroid. Um, they include other things in the thyroid, such as T1 and T2, that might be important that are not in synthetics. Um, you can do T4, um, T4 desiccated thyroid combinations. Proper treatment needs to be individualized, just like there's not one blood pressure medicine, you should not just one thyroid medicine. Multiple studies have shown poor quality of life among the percentage, about 15% of patients on levothyroxine. A study from by Panikur in 2009 showed that 16% of patients have a polymorphism, which means a change in DNA in their enzyme that converts T4 to T3. These patients did better on T4, T3 combination. Um, so I want to talk about desiccated thyroid. Uh, armor thyroid is made by Forrest Labs, and there was, um, there is, I think, especially among traditional endocrinologists, some concern about variability in preparation and lack of standardization. I think these are untrue. Um, most studies have shown that, uh, reports have shown that the armor thyroid and other desiccated thyroid have a reliable amount of thyroid hormone in the major companies that have quality control. Um, a new brand is called WP Thyroid. It's a brand with minimal binders or fillers. I probably like that the best. Um, it has a higher T3 to T4 ratio than the human thyroid. So may, most patients on desiccated thyroid have a high free T3, a low free T4, and a low TSH. Therefore, I usually give them a little less desiccated thyroid and a little bit more T4. The T3 has a short half-life, so if you give T3 or desiccated thyroid, it should be given at least twice a day. There may be other components of the thyroid missing in synthetic preparation. I usually give the desiccated thyroid twice a day with some extra T4 supplementation, especially patients that are not doing well on T4 alone. You can also do a combination of a, of a higher dose of T4 with a low dose of once a day desiccated thyroid, and that seems to be another alternative. For hypopit patients, I usually aim for the free T4 and free T3 to be in the upper range of normal with a suppressed TSH. Um, there was, I think, a very remarkable study published in the Journal of Clinical Anthropology and Metabolism by Wang and colleagues from the Walter Reed Medical Center in Bethesda. They did a crossover study in which 70%, 70 patients completed the study, and you received either desiccated thyroid or armor in that case, or levothyroxine. Um, they, in the introduction of this paper, they commented that the T4 and TV content of desiccated thyroid preparation, especially armor, has now been standardized. They cited a paper by J.C. Lowe published in a journal called Thyroid Science that shows that armor thyroid has indeed been standardized that one grain of armor thyroid contains 38 micrograms, 38 micrograms, sorry, of levothyroxine and 9 micrograms of um, biothyroid. 
E3. So in this uh, study with uh, published in JCM from the Bethesda group, they uh, took patients that were on a stable dose of levothyroxine and had normal TSH values. 78 patients were randomized, 70 including the study, 35 received armothyroid at the beginning, and 35 received levothyroxine at the beginning. Um, the dose of either uh, levothyroxine or armor was adjusted after six weeks of the TSH is between 0.5 and 3. They continued on that dose for an initial 10 weeks, and after 16 weeks, the patients were switched over to the other compound with the same uh, adjustment of six weeks and then for another 10 weeks. So it was a crossover study. Um, there was not a statistical improvement in terms of for general health questionnaires and neuropsychiatric testing. However, there was a trend towards improvement in these tests for the group that took the desiccated thyroid compared to the lethal thyroid replacement. There was a 2.8 pound weight loss among the groups that took the desiccated thyroid compared to the thyroid that was significant. The patients on armor thyroid had a slightly lower uh, HDL, your good cholesterol, um, so that is a potential detriment to armor replacement. Both the T4 and the free T4 are much lower on the armor thyroid than on the thyroid replacement alone, um, indicating that patients on armor need an additional dose of the thyroid as I often prescribe. However, most importantly, 49% of the patients preferred armor thyroid, 19% preferred levothyroxine, and 33 did not notice a difference. This was important as the study was blinded and they didn't know which thyroid preparation they were taking, and indicates that there was some subtle improvement in how they were feeling with the armor, and this is why they liked the armor. The subgroup that preferred the armor lost even more weight. They lost four pounds in the armor compared to levothyroxine, and this subgroup had better well-being and thyroid symptoms were significantly better with better cognitive function on the armor thyroid as compared to levothyroxine. And this suggests that a subset of patients need armor thyroid as opposed to levothyroxine alone. These may be poor converters of T4 to T3. Um, another study of note um, was published in JCM in 2011 from the NIH group uh, with uh, Seeley as the first author. They found that patients on T3 alone had lower weight and better lipid profiles than those on T4 alone. I usually give T4, T3 combination therapy or the desiccated thyroid T4 combination therapy to those that don't do as well on levothyroxine alone. Um, and there are many studies that suggest these patients do better on combination. Um, even though the Sealy paper did look at the found application of the T3 alone, did a little better than the T4 alone. I usually don't like that. I'd rather have a combination treatment. If you take T3 alone, your T4 goes to zero if your thyroid's not working or your pituitary's not working. I don't think it's good to have a major hormone zero and it gives you no reserve if you miss a dose. Uh, so I usually don't give the T3 alone. I like the reservoir effect of the T4 plus a short acting boost of the T3. Um, so, in general, um, take your thyroid medicines first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. If you take a second dose, uh, take it at two in the afternoon, take it in the mid-afternoon. Avoid taking thyroid medicine with things like iron, calcium, vitamins with iron, calcium, proton pump inhibitors like uh, protonics, uh, paraphate, oral dysphosphonates like phosphomax, or less data, or cholestyramine. Try to take it separately from these medicines. There's a minor effect of soy, so it's probably better not to take it with soy as well. Um, and interesting is to use the, uh, something called selenium. Selenium is a trace mineral, increases T4 to T3 conversion and reduces TPO antibody levels. Patients with untreated growth hormone deficiency have decreased T4 to T3 conversion, but they, so they are likely to benefit from selenium, but they also may benefit from growth hormone treatment as well. Um, there was a study when they used selenium to treat uh, melanomas. There was a side effect of increased rate of diabetes in patients on selenium. Although there was a recent study looking at um, patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome and their glycemia uh, values got better. So still, I'm a little cautious about giving uh, selenium to those with prediabetes or diabetes or a family history of it. Um, you have to weigh the risk and benefits of that increased T4 to T3 conversion with a slight possibility of increased risk of diabetes. Okay, we'll go on to growth hormone deficiency. I think you guys heard a lot about growth hormone deficiency. Yes, Sabina? Right, so iron, good point. So iron deficiency does affect both the conversion of T4 to T3 and some of the action of T4, of T3 in the cell. So that's right. Um, you know, I think it's low, but, you know, it was over a large number of patients that got selenium in the study. 
So, you know, it's probably a slight increase rate. Type two. Uh, patients with uh, hypotreaters have increased mortality, and this may be due to the growth or hormone deficiency that's untreated. Um, growth hormone deficiency in adults results in decreased bone formation, increased fat mass or central obesity, decreased muscle mass, lipid abnormalities, increased thickness of blood vessels, increased inflammatory yeah. markers, impaired quality of life, increased number of sick days, impaired exercise tolerance, and most of these symptoms are corrected by treatment. So I screen for growth and deficiency with an IGF-1. If you're in the top 75% of the range for your age and sex, a, a, a IGF-1 of greater than 150, growth hormone deficiency is less likely. If you have empty cell uh, history of head trauma, headaches, and low blood pressure after delivery, which is called Sheehan syndrome, history of pituitary surgery or radiation, or a pituitary tumor, such as a macro microadenoma, growth hormone deficiency is likely. If your IGF-1 is uh, less than 75, growth hormone deficiency is likely. So you have a whole bunch of patients with an IGF-1 between 75 to 150, and you need to do stimulation testing. I usually use a glucose stimulation test um, with a cutoff that um, probably five is a reasonable choice. Um, some patients I try to get approved if they're less than eight, um, but five is probably a reasonable choice. Um, you can do an insulin tolerance test as well. Um, it's cut off of that as five. I usually use a glucon stimulation test. Um, patients don't like IGTs. They make some hypoglycemic. Doctors don't like to do it. I don't like to do it. My colleague doesn't like to do it. Um, but it, you can do it for adrenal insufficiency as it gives you that value also. Um, most, some insurances want a second test, um, and the, I often use the Arginine stimulation test, which was part of the Arginine GHRH test that we are GHRH. It was no longer available, but the Arginine is. Um, I don't agree that mild growth hormone deficiency should not be treated. I'm not sure why, and I'll go into this a little bit more. Um, many endocrinologists don't want to treat mild growth hormone deficiency. Um, the stimulation tests are, are non-physiological, but still the gold standard and needed for insurance coverage. Um, you know, more important might be the day-to-day -day, uh, IGF-1. Um, so I don't, it's unclear what to do with a patient with hypertrichism, low IGF-1, and a normal stimulation testing. There is a supplement called Cerevital. There is another one called D-Transtropin, but I think Cerevital seems to be a little bit better. You can get it at Cerevital.com, and it stimulates the hypothalamus to secrete more growth hormone releasing hormone. It's available online without a prescription. That is an alternative to somebody with low IGF-1 who passed their stimulation testing. Um, treatment, um, in general, adults need about 10% of the dose for body weight compared to children. You don't need to adjust for body weight. Women, especially on oral estrogens, need higher doses than men. I usually start at 0.4 milligrams in women and 0.2 milligrams in men. The final dose varies widely and cannot be predicted. You titrate upwards with the IGF-1 monthly, measured every month, and aim for an IGF-1 sort of in the upper third of normal range, somewhere around 200 or 300 for most assays. I usually don't see much of an improvement until you get to that increase. Uh, too much uh, growth hormone usually gives you joint, uh, especially hand swelling and pain, um, so that's a sign that you're taking too much. Um, so an article uh, by my colleague uh, Shlomo Melmid in the Journal of Clinical Anthology and Metabolism suggested that idiopathic, which means without a clear cause, growth hormone deficiency does not exist. This article suggested that growth hormone deficiency should be only treated if it's severe and the patient has other pituitary hormone deficiencies. And in fact, many insurance companies require that patient have at least two to three other pituitary hormone deficiencies before treatment. This doesn't make any sense to me because growth hormone, as I said, is deficiency, is the first hormone to be affected through the damage. So um, why not just treat the growth hormone deficiency? Why do you need to wait for the other hormones to be deficient? Um, so the question is, why is mild growth hormone deficiency not treated? On the other hand, almost everybody treats mild cortisol deficiency. The question is why. Cheaper, excellent. Um, so uh, which one should you treat? In medicine, in general, we look at the benefits and risks of treatment, and the treatment for cortisol deficiency is giving hydrocortisone. Certainly hydrocortisone is needed, uh, if it's needed, it should be given, but in many borderline cases, it's really unclear whether hydrocortisone needs to be given. When you give exogenous cortisol, it shuts down so the adrenal glands make its own cortisol, therefore once it starts, it's hard to stop. And additionally, excess cortisol, and it's often, you know, hard to adjust 
the right amount and lead to weight gain, diabetes, infections, and osteoporosis. Um, many endocrinologists erroneously feel that patients can die suddenly from cortisol deficiency. This is based on older literature and really occurred in only patients with severe cortisol deficiency. More recent literature suggests that patients with mild cortisol deficiency do not die suddenly and do not need to be treated with hydrocortisone, and you have to weigh the benefits of treatment with exogenous hydrocortisone. Um, most likely outweigh the risk unless the cortisol deficiency is more, more severe. Um, hormone deficiency should be guided by symptoms. Patients with low cortisol have nauseousness, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, joint pains, and weight loss. And patients who failed the cosentropin test or cortisol stimulation test and told um, they have mild cortisol deficiency may not have these symptoms. Um, most patients that I see with hypoperiodism have more symptoms of excess cortisol, like weight gain, rather than cortisol deficiency. So in contrast, patients with both hormone deficiency do have weight gain, they have trouble sleeping, they have psychological, psychiatric problems, including depression, mood swings, and irritability. The quality of life and functionality is much lower. And all these uh, symptoms are improved with growth hormone replacement. Uh, growth hormone replacement has very little side effects. The main side effects are, growth, are joint pains and edema. Some patients on growth hormone replacement can get worse than glucose control, but in general, the patients feel so much better on growth hormone replacement, they exercise more, they feel better, and their glycemia improves. Um, and I have found that patients with mild growth hormone deficiency do just as well on uh, growth hormone replacement is also severe. We're trying to study that um, and look at somebody that had a glucose stimulation test that peaked between three and eight, whether they do just as well as somebody that had a growth hormone stimulation test of less than three. But my guess is that this is going to be the case. And as Adina said, I suggest the real reason why growth hormone deficiency is not treated while mild cortisol deficiency is treated has to do with cost and insurance. Growth hormone replacement is quite expensive and can cost over $1,000 a month, while cortisol replacement is quite inexpensive. Because of the cost of growth hormone replacement, most patients uh, need their insurance to pay for it. Insurance companies are getting more and more reluctant to cover uh, growth hormone replacement, possibly because of the cost. Because I'm very interested in improving the patient's quality of life, especially with also hypothyroidism, I and my office will try to tr uh, fight for patient growth hormone deficiency be covered by their insurance, so these patients could benefit from growth hormone replacement, and I think the Magic Foundation also really helps patients try to get their growth hormone covered. So for all these reasons, I think um, it's reasonable to try to treat mild growth hormone deficiency, and we should try to be aggressive with that as we are for cortisol deficiency. What about estrogen replacement in women? Um, amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea indicates um, uh, gonadotropin deficiency. Irregular periods may be an early sign of pituitary dysfunction. There are studies, the Women's Health Initiative and the HERS study looked at postmenopausal women that were not previously on estrogen. The average age of the Women's Health Initiative was 63, and they used oral estrogen pre pre um, preparations. Um, however, younger women, especially women that have hypothyroidism, they're hypo, you know, the hypogonadal for many years. They probably benefit from estrogen replacement, and they usually have a better quality of life on higher estrogen replacement. It may require higher doses than postmenopausal women. Um, most importantly, oral but not transdermal estrogens inhibit the action of growth hormone in the liver. This leads to higher growth hormone and lower IGF-1 levels. I avoid estri oral estrogens or growth control pills for patients on growth hormone. I like using an estrogen patch like Clomera Vival or Estagel, which is a cream. You can titrate the dose so that the estradiol is in the upper range of normal for a follicular period, about 50 to 100. Patients with an intact uterus should get uh, progesterone. I like the medicine for nutrium. It's also bioidentical. Um, you can give it every uh, month to induce a period. You can give it every three months to have a period. It should be given at night because it's sedating. Um, however, if a woman is on oral estrogen and birth control pills and stays on the same dose of growth hormone, her IGF-1 will rise dramatically and she'll likely get the hand swelling and joint pain. So you need to cut down the dose when you take somebody off of oral estrogen or birth control pills. Um, for men, um, giving androgen replacement is certainly standard care. Symptoms of uh, androgen replacement include low libido, erectile dysfunction, fatigue, decreased muscle mass. Small testes or enlarged breasts, gynecomastia may be seen in helpful borderline cases. Um, usually, we have to, you measure the total testosterone free by equilibrium dialysis. 
If the total testosterone is less than 200, testosterone deficiency is likely. If it's between uh, 200 to 350, I usually look at the free testosterone use clinical judgment. Um, LH and FSH are not really that helpful, but they do exclude the primary hypogonadism when you have a testicular problem and your LH and FSH are high. Um, testosterone gels or packs is usually the easiest thing for men. However, injections often give better results for erectile dysfunction. Uh, a new option is to give it subcutaneously in your stomach shots twice a week. Works well, and I have a YouTube video. Uh, you can look up uh, Friedman and uh, testosterone. Should come up at the top of the YouTube. Um, another uh, drug to use is called HCG. Um, it does not cause testicular sh shrinkage. It's like the LH on the pituitary, so it um, keeps the, the testes uh, normal size. Another drug to use is called clomiphene or clomid. It blocks feedback inhibition by the estradiol on the pituitary. This increases LH and uh, then testosterone. It's the only way to treat uh, testosterone deficiency with a pill. Uh, 50 milligrams every other day is a reasonable dose. The main side effect is breast enlargement. Um, it's a good uh, solution, at least short term, as it stimulates the hypothalamic pituitary canal axis. Um, I usually aim for total testosterone levels in the upper normal range. You can give an androgen patch, you can give an androgel, you can give the shot, testosterone shots 50 milligrams twice a week. Uh, for women, um, women with hypothyroidism have low testosterone levels. This is due to both the effect of LH on the ovaries and the effect of low ACTH on the adrenals. You want to measure testosterone and usually bioavailable testosterone, but free testosterone is not really that much that reliable in women. It needs to be done by a good laboratory and can be a clue to hypothyroidism if I find the low free testosterone, a bioavailable testosterone in a woman, I am more concerned they have a pituitary problem. Um, we are do, we did a study, which we're still trying to write up here, on uh, testosterone levels in women with hypothyroidism and normal volunteers. Uh, we found that the low testosterone levels in women were correlated to subjective measures, including low libido, low arousal, low mood, depression, and fatigue. Objective measures of sexual function, including general sensation, general blood flow were not uh, well correlated with testosterone levels. However, in a small number of patients treated with a testosterone gel, these did not improve the treatment. So um, I still think in women it's helpful. Um, in general, our conclusion is that hypothyroidism leads to impairment in subjective and not objective sexual function. Testosterone more likely affects the brain rather than a peripheral process. Um, and things like general sensation of blood flow are probably not testosterone mediated. So I still recommend testosterone in women with a low, um, low a level less than 10 in a good assay. Um, with a testosterone cream, compounding pharmacies, I use Delva Pharmacy in St. Louis. They have very reliable and safe preparations. Um, most of my patients on the testosterone cream go from a low level to a high normal level with minimal side effects. The side effects include acne, extra hair growth, rage, and oily skin. Another alternative that I'm just starting to use in some patients is subcutaneous testosterone in women. A dose would be five milligrams per week or 2.5 milligrams twice a week. Um, diabetes insipidus is due to the hormone ADH being deficient. Its symptoms are excessive urination and thirst. Uh, mild patient, cases are probably common and worthy of treatment. Uh, chronic excess urination can lead to bladder and kidney problems. And the key question is how many times you wake up at night. If it's a lot, you probably have this. Um, I screen by doing a 24-hour urine collection to measure the volume. We often do that when we're looking for, um, when we're looking for cortisol replacement. A volume greater than three liters indicates diabetes insipidus is likely, and then I confirm with a 12-hour fast with no water, especially an 8 a.m. serum and urine osmolality. On diabetes insipidus, you have a high serum osmolality greater than 300, a low urine osmolality greater than 500, and a low uh, ADP level. Probably don't need a formal water uh, deprivation test. Um, DDAV pills are probably the best of the many endocrinologists use nasal puffs. Nasal puffs may work a little quicker, but uh, most of the time the DDAV pills are better um, and more consistent. The trick is to get, give most of it at night so they don't have um, wake, you know, people don't have to wake up at night. You still want to have a uh, period of breakthrough urination during the day where you urinate um, your normal amount. Treatment is pretty benign, and I think this is improves people's quality of life a lot. Um, so most patients are on too much cortisol, not enough thyroid medicine, not enough growth hormone, not on testosterone, this leads to weight gain and depression. Go get your uh, doses adjusted. 
Um, I want to talk now briefly about oxytocin. This is a new interest of mine. Um, oxytocin is available from, thank you, from Bellevue Compounding Pharmacy as a sublingual tablet or nasal spray. Oxytocin is um, made by the posterior pituitary. Um, it's the, um, it's like AVP, it's the only posterior pituitary hormone that we don't test for or replace commonly. It may have a role in bonding, intimacy, orgasm, GI issues, trust, generosity, uh, pain, and energy. A 2015 Energy Society abstract from a group that's in Boston showed that oxytocin led to weight loss in men. There is an assay for 24-hour urine oxytocin available in Ridden Valley Labs, but the people at the lab won't give me any information on its reliability. So I'm a little bit uh, suspected of it. Um, but I do give a questionnaire for patients, and we do measure this 24-hour urine. I'd like to do it before and after. So if you're one of my established patients, we'd like to um, happy to put you on oxytocin. Many patients find that it's quite helpful, but not everybody. What's that? Okay, so we have one uh, one convert here. Yeah. Uh, hormone interactions are crucial. Um, treating patient, and I think many doctors don't understand this, treating patient with adrenal insufficiency and hypothyroidism, you treat them with thyroid hormone, you increase the breakdown of cortisol, it may lead to an adrenal crisis. Thyroid hormone may also lead to the increased uh, catabolism, the breakdown of other hormones like growth hormone and testosterone, and you may need to adjust those doses when you reach a thyroid dose. Treating with growth hormone may increase T4 to T3 conversion. So if you're on T3, your dose may be reduced, may be reduced. Um, if you're on T4, it may need to be increased. Uh, oral but not transdermal estrogen increase the need for levothyroxine in women. Oral but not transdermal estrogen increase the need for growth hormone replacement. Stopping oral estrogen leads to an elevated IGF-1, leads to hand swelling or edema. Patients on growth hormone should not probably be on, should probably not be on oral estrogen, so both the balls and stuff that back. Uh, treating adrenal insufficiency, meaning unmasked diabetes insipidus, and testosterone raises your IGF-1. Yes, come back. I'm one of the last cases. Yeah. Testosterone raises that, I think. The main thing is Probably, um, maybe you don't even lower dose then. Um, increasing growth hormone or IGF-1 leads to lower levels of cortisol because of the way. Enzyme 11 beta HGP-1. Therefore, treating a patient with hypopaturism with growth hormone will decrease cortisol levels. And I had a patient that was over uh, replaced on glucocorticoids, under replaced on thyroid, not treated with growth hormone. We started her on growth hormone, increased her glucocorticoids, and increased her thyroid medicine, and all three together. That was a mistake. She went into the adrenal crisis. So make changes slowly and monitor frequently. Other tricks I recommend is your ferritins, your uh, iron stores. Anemia is a late sign of uh, low iron. Most menstruating women have low iron stores. Iron is needed for thyroid hormone synthesis and actions, as Adina said. Low ferritin leads to low blood volume, not enough blood going to your brain, it gives you fatigue. Try to aim around 70 and have an hour on call my website about the uh, iron replacement. Stimulants seem to be quite helpful in cases with pituitary problems. There's a report that patients with pituitary problems have what's called apathetic depression or lethargy and feeling run down rather than sad and blue. They respond to stimulants like renal and Adderall better than antidepressants. Stimulants help with atypical depression, give more energy, help with focus, leads to decreased appetite and weight loss. All these are good things for patients with hypertrogism. They are controlled substances. They're fairly safe and probably easier to get off of than compared to antidepressants. Side effects include uh, trouble sleeping, hyperactivity, higher uh, hyper, feeling hyper, high blood pressure, higher pulse. I usually use a Ritalin LA at 20 more rounds in the morning. Um, here's uh, my book. It's not so new anymore, but books uh, often people find helpful. Um, contact numbers are listed there.
And again, thanks to the Magic Foundation for inviting me and Diane who does a great job organizing this. I always like coming here. Um, time for 10 minutes of questions or so. Um, I'm, I think you should be cautious um, and just watch it so it doesn't go up more. Um, there are some new studies suggesting that it doesn't affect the chance of prostate cancer much, but um, um, yeah, I think you should be cautious, especially if you have symptoms of, you know, prostate hypertrophy. Okay. So the question is about um, pain management. I'm presuming we're talking about opiates. Um, so I uh, did uh, write it as one of the most cited reviews and endocrine reviews on effective opiates on the pituitary. Opiates definitely reduce your uh, testosterone, probably both men and women. Uh, opiates likely reduce your growth hormone, and opiates likely reduce your cortisol and may affect the thyroid. And there's somewhere around five to 10 million people in the United States on chronic opiates. So it's a huge problem um, that if really gives people pituitary problems. I think some of the problems people have, why they don't still feel well on the opiates is because it affects their pituitary. Um, so with that in mind, though, I think your question is more, you know, if you're already on it, you just need to monitor people's levels, just like uh, if you're on it anyway. If you're on you know, testosterone, you really want to look for testosterone level in sort of mid to high normal range. Um, thyroid the same way, cortisol symptoms and uh, very free cortisol. You know? Are there any non-opioid non medications that not affect any of the hormones that are safe and are safe? Okay, so Dina's question is about non-opiate pain medicines that doesn't affect the pituitary. So first of all, within opiate pain medicines, there's a medicine called bupromorphine that is a partial agonist of opiates that seems to be the safest one in terms of affecting your, uh, your other axes. Um, I was going to try to do a study with my colleague um, who's an expert in this area, Stan Van Um, on this medicine. We haven't gotten around to it yet, but it, it seems like in the literature that one, uh, buprenorphine, is the best one to take. Um, another medicine that's probably reasonable to take is tramadol. So tramadol is sort of a cross between an opiate and a non steroidal Recently, it was raised up that it has to be on a controlled substance, but it seems to have less effects than uh, your standard opiates. And then uh, non steroidals can be quite effective for pain as well. Exercise is great for pain if you that's all your pain is, but releases your endorphins. Mm -hmm. Um. Not really. It's a partial agonist. So it binds to the receptor a little bit and stimulates a little bit. So you usually don't get much what's called tolerance to it uh, as opposed to the regular opiates. And you usually don't have to take more and more of it. Are all receptors that was what I was saying. I was thinking about this. So patients with pituitary problems, and, I, and um, I didn't ask you this before. Don't have beta, they probably don't have beta norphine. It's very hard to measure. It probably upregulates your receptors, so you probably respond better to pain because your receptors are higher. And so a lower dose of pain might be effective, not it's sort of the opposite of what you expect. Phil? Okay, so uh, talking about the biomedical research uh, someone has no thyroid to depression at all. Um, so when you're treated with thyroid, you probably catabolize, you break down your IGF, your growth hormone more. So you, um, you know, so if you're untreated, you need less of it. Once you're treated with it, you need more. Presumably, if you're treated with it a little bit you know, higher, because when you have thyroid cancer, you want a lower TSH, maybe you're going to break it down even a little bit more. But I think basically you're still going to be monitoring people with your IGF-1 and still aiming for an upper normal range regardless. Do you think that the pain is higher? No, I don't think so. Um, 
Well, I don't think they necessarily boost growth hormone. I think what happens is patients with hypoperturism have untreated growth hormone deficiency and they feel lousy and they're unfocused and things like that. And instead of going for growth hormone, they go for stimulants. They still, you know, they work some, um, but, you know, presumably some of the football players that have the head traumas, clearly they're going to be hypopet, you know, and banging their head all the time, you know, their stock is stretched. I think some of them have a lot, you know, high rate of suicide and depression, unfortunately. And I think some of that maybe if they had growth on, they could be treated. Um, in terms of long-term effects of the stimulants, I think they're quite effective. I mean, they've been around for many years. They've been used in kids, which would be the sort of the ultimate test of, you know, how what happens to a kid when they grow up. And what's your uh, vital? Yeah, vital. Um, Oh, okay. Um, they haven't been around in a long time, um, but they're pretty natural things like amino acids. And I think they raise, you know, for the most part, they would raise your IGF-1 from low to normal. Right? They're not that potent, so you're not going to get sky high levels of IGF-1 if you're concerned about, you know, you developing acromegalic symptoms or the high IGF-1 leading to cancer. So in general, no, I don't think so. So it's, you know, it's been like the hypothalamus in patients with, um, you know, impaired hypothalamus protrude axis. It probably still works some. Maybe it doesn't work quite as well. Um, but I think it still works some. Uh, what's your opinion on the testosterone uh, separation of all the Um, I think you can lump all the testosterone cream sort together, whether you put it on your underarm or put it and use an antigel or test them. I don't think there's a major difference in that. I think it's just one delivery way. Um, as I sort of said, that many of my patients seem to like the um, the shots better for erectile dysfunction. Um, the um, and I think taking up subcutaneous is so much easier than taking up IM. People will be um, more willing to take it. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So I think it's it's often not needed. Um, you have what's called the cortisone cortisol shuttle, where your cortisol cortisol, if you measure in the blood, most of the day is close to zero. So you're going to say, could I ask Dr. Heimarsh while I was here, why do people don't you know drop over dead when their cortisol is zero throughout the afternoon? It's because it goes into the cell to this hormone called cortisone which then is not metabolized. Then it gets converted back to cortisol when it's sort of needed throughout the day. Um, so most people, their, their cortisol, the cortisol will be quite low throughout the day. And if it's not, they're probably getting too much. But I think his point is, you compare, he has a lot of normals. So if you sort of sub so compare what your arm replacement to normal, it's probably somewhat helpful, but I don't think it's that helpful. Um, and I think most of the patients that, we, that I have uh, do pretty well on cortisol. You can do the 24-hour urine for your 17 hydroxy steroids and get a range. Um, but that's something I might look into further. Was it pretty impressive what he showed yesterday? Okay. Yeah. And he measured it in serum and salivary, or just serum? Serum. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. This is measurement of serum cortisol. So that, that's my point, I think, is most of the time your serum cortisol is zero, except in the morning. A little bit of peak after meals. Um, 
So that's why I don't think it's that helpful to, to, to measure it at different times of the day, because most of the time it's going to be, you know, close to zero or you know, sort of reflecting what you took. So if you took it an hour before, yeah, it's going to be pretty high. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so I think that's a good question. So it probably varies a little bit in and out. Most of the patients that are on that have hypothyroidism that are on cortisol replacement, their own cortisol stops, you know, shuts down. Um, it is one of the hormones, like I think growth hormone is less, you stop growth hormone, your growth hormone goes back up. When you take cortisol for long term, your own gland, you know, somewhat stops working. There's some variability, and, you know, depends on how much you're taking. If you're taking 25 milligrams, it's more likely to stop working. If you're taking 10 milligrams. So I think if you're taking 25 milligrams, which mostly what you're taking is what your the pill is. If you're taking 10 milligrams, you know, then it's going to be sort of a combination of what your body's making versus the, uh, the pill. The way I see it. And then, you know, you still try, try to take as little as you can. And um, so you get some symptoms and add back, add back a little bit. Right. Exactly. Give you one or two more questions. Are you <laughs> You know, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess you'd say, you know, that there's um, 15 million people with hypothyroidism, probably a couple hundred thousand with Cushing's. Um, so I don't think Adam's media feeds as much uh, need for it, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll think about it. You know. yeah. Sometimes, it's in the, in the, especially these people with this apathetic type of depression that patients in high school didn't get. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I think more depression. Sometimes it's an anxiety. Um, I use juice bar a fair amount. Some of the SSRIs work. Juice bar? Other questions? One more? Uh huh. Yeah, I think so. Either take enough salt in your diet or take a salt bath, it's usually beneficial. And you, yeah, one or the other. And then, you know, you can tell if you're salt craving, you need more salt. If your renin's high, you probably need more salt plus the foreign app. The foreign app sort of needs the salt to bring it in. So if you're really like on a very salty diet, the point is probably not going to be enough. So you do have to have a fair amount of salt. Thank you, Dr. Friedman, for coming again. Thank you. To present to you. Thank you. Uh, get the pictures. I'll turn off the uh, recording here. And uh, hopefully we all learned about